one of the things that seems to be happening with the onset of the grand solar minimum is that we are losing our Goldilocks kind of growing conditions. When you watch the U.S. weather map continuously, you see that it, it goes from too warm to too cold, too wet to too dry, instead of kind of the nice even balance that we need for all kinds of crops, whether it's row crops of corn and soybeans or citrus fruits. And if you look at that map, you see that there is kind of an arc from Seattle to Houston uh, where it is on the dry side. And in San Francisco, I'm in part of that arc. And that's kind of what the um, GSM seems to be shaping up as for California. You know, last year we were celebrating what we thought was the end of the drought, and now it seems like we are completely back in the drought conditions. And this could be the terrible mega drought that California worries about and actually experiences from time to time. So that being the case, you know, I am personally kind of shifting into what I would call a, a red alert mode here because it looks like, you know, things are, are going to get difficult. One of the things that I think is going to be a good solution for the Grand Solar Minimum is the wicking type of irrigation system. I have spent some time recently taking another look at hydroponics, uh, including the Kratky method, and I think overall uh, hydroponics is, is just a really fiddly, fragile kind of way to grow things. If nothing else, you know, soil gives you all kinds of good things in the way of bacteria and mycorrhiza and things like this that help fight disease. All that is gone typically with hydroponics and you end up trying to maintain a sterile system which is quite hard to do and fails from time to time. And along with that, a lot of the hydroponic systems that you do look at seem to have uh, a lot of automation now, a lot of computerized stuff. Uh, when you look at some of the very newest indoor vertical farms, they seem to have taken kind of workable outdoor greenhouse type of methods and turned them into high-tech fantasies with artificial intelligence and thousands of monitors when all you really need is a, a person to walk around from time to time and look at things. Another thing about uh, wick irrigation systems is that if you look around on YouTube you will find cases where people in very poor countries in India and Africa are successfully making wick irrigation systems in, in dry hot places and getting good crops from them using recycled materials. You know, the, the problem is not that we have a shortage of dirt or soil. The problem is a shortage of water. Okay, so in any wick irrigation system, um, rope is kind of the critical element. Um, I see people, examples of people tearing up strips of material and claiming that those work pretty good at wicks. Uh, I've done some experiments with that that weren't entirely satisfactory. So I really come back to uh, using rope. Um, Here's an example of something I used, which was just a, a hank of rope that I had laying around the house. It's 3 8 inch, I think it's polyester. And what you can see on the inside is that this rope has a center of fibers with something wrapped around it. And I think these fibers really form a pipeline for the water. And if you take a look at this insulation here and go over and squeeze this hose at this point in time, you can feel that it is saturated and this is after being in place for about 24 hours. The other thing you can see in this picture are the white pipes and these were pieces of PVC that had lain around the house, half inch and three quarter inch. You know, since the uh, rope runs some distance from the bucket to some of the pots, it seemed like a good idea to cover them. I was at Lowe's and I looked at some half inch vinyl tubing which had kind of an oval shape and I thought it's going to be hard to get the rope to go down this thing um, and, and I did not buy it. So you have three pots set up that way and then uh, I have a third, a fourth pot now set up where I'm using another thing that seems to work very well which is your trusty parachute cord, all-purpose kind of material. Here again you have fibers um, running down that cord with uh, a wrapping on the outside and they seem to saturate very quickly. So when I set these pots up, one thing I want to mention is the amount of rope on the inside of the pot is about one and a half times the circumference of the pot. 
and when I added the soil I gradually raised the rope and in kind of a spiral fashion to distribute the water throughout the soil. I think one of the main advantages of wick irrigation is that it works 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and I think this is also a clue as to why hydroponics can be very productive. It's not because they're growing without soil in, you know, with fertilizer, it's because those systems are being flushed with water several times per hour in, in some cases and that is providing the plant with a pretty steady supply of moisture to encourage growth. I also want to point out what I'm growing in these pots because I think it is relevant at this point in time. This is kale and this is collards and this is another collard plant which I had last year and actually in this case uh, the rats had eaten this down to a stump and I was thinking about throwing this away when I noticed that it had these leaves growing on it. The point being that crops like these are tolerant to cooler temperatures and they're tolerant to lower light levels. These plants are actually in an alleyway in between uh, two houses in San Francisco. In the summer there will get some direct light down this alleyway but right now it's all reflected light. But you have these plants that are cold tolerant Another important thing is that some of these plants will provide a continuous harvest as opposed to either being cut once and thrown away or you know, waiting until you get fruit like the tomatoes. And uh, I actually have a, a shard plant. I have two shard plants in another part of the yard which were planted sometime last year. So these plants could be like nine months old and they're still producing. And uh, I think that's a really good thing uh, in terms of having an abundant food supply from a small amount of space. This is one of the shard plants I was talking about. This was planted sometime during the middle of last year. Um, it slowed down, of course, during the winter time, but now it's producing um, leaves on a pretty regular basis. I need to start harvesting them. And here's the really old shard plant that I was talking about. I think at some point I actually uh, just cut these back and thought I would let them go and they would not give up so I said okay and started taking care of them again. The leaves are smaller you know I think it may be interesting to uh, take these out and repot them with some fresh soil give them a new start on life and and see uh, but if not they don't owe me anything. And here I have another experiment that I call the Leaning Tower of Shard. This is a piece of 3 inch PVC I had a two inch hole saw which I used to drill holes and then I got these one and a quarter inch 90 degree fittings uh, which I kind of locked in there with um, a self tapping screw. So we'll see how these go. You know I do have problems with rats in my yard and I found that shard is one of the things they don't eat. So that's why I have shard in this. After I built this thing I was looking on Amazon and I saw something that just looked like a piece of PVC with holes drilled in the sides. Uh, no fittings or anything. That would certainly be a much cheaper way to do this. And I think if you had well established starts such as these shard plants, you know, you could just plug the root balls in sideways and you could let them grow and they'd be fine. That is the kind of open question. Will they turn the corner and grow up? Okay, so I have some other experiments going. I'm going to take the camera in and show you some of those as well. So at this point, wicking has become my method of choice for keeping things hydrated. And here you see a case of just kind of some kind of blue plastic rope. And it's two strands twisted together, but it seems to be wicking up okay. A lot of these things, if you just try them, squeeze them, you'll get moisture on your fingers. So it's slowly working away. One of my sources said that uh, polyester fabric is a very good wicking material. So here's a case where a piece of that fabric with the corner dipped in water it seems to be doing a pretty good job of hydrating this bed of lettuce and um, some pea sprouts here, some pea microgreens. See this is a pretty nice piece of lettuce there. That's maybe a month old. And here's my other choice um, where I have a piece of paracord with an end coiled in a cup of water laying on top of some paper towels. I've used paper towels in the past to grow things on. I had a pretty nice stand of sunflowers a while back growing just on paper towels. This installation has been in place for a few hours. Uh, the paper towels were laid down dry and now I can see that the dampness has slowly spread across the paper towels and probably down at the end. Um, 
this piece of rope is still dry so what it is the water coming out of this end here is moved down um, into the paper towel and I expect it will ultimately saturate that whole thing it is uh, it's damp back here so it's just a question of whether or not the plants are going to reach up and get it now here's a tray where I'm not sure what is really happening so here's a tray where I initially set this up with a piece of polyester fabric thinking that the water should wick up through there and into the flat area where the lettuce seedlings are and it looked like for a long time nothing happened so I actually went back into there and put another piece of rope back in there you can just see the end here which I use as kind of a bridge to get over it and then down in through here and now it seems to be wicking perhaps almost too well but these plants are taking what they want these little plastic cups here uh, this is another experiment where I took these plastic drink cups and drilled five holes in the bottom. Uh, the original intention was to use these with the Kratky hydroponics method. I have not decided to do that. I may do that. I may put these in soil. Who knows what. Now something I want to talk about is I did get a little supply of these three inch net cups for hydroponics. And I'm not probably going to use them for hydroponics. But it occurred to me that one good idea would be to line these with unbleached paper towel and start seeds in them eventually the seed the the plants will start to poke roots out through the napkin and through the holes in the pot and at that point you could just take the whole pot and plant it in the ground and avoid transplantation shock now this of course is not going to work with uh, any plant that has a big taproot but I think a lot of things that we commonly grow or commonly, that I commonly grow um, are going to have more of a fibrous root system and it should work just fine. I will report on that when it happens. And here I have another evolving experiment. I would like to be able to grow microgreens on top of a piece of cotton fabric which would provide kind of a support so that if I had a whole flat of microgreens I could just pull that out and basically sell it as living greens with the cotton fabric supporting it and I think it may actually work out but what I'm finding is the cotton fabric is not at all a good wick you know this particular group of plants may not make it because they dried out but what I did do is I went under there and put a piece of the pink polyester under there and also uh, have a piece of paracord under there uh, in a bowl of water and you can see these are radishes and uh, broccoli seeds. Some of the radishes are actually standing up and growing so the roots may penetrate and maybe the broccoli will start to recover as well. I have had a situation where I grew some sunflowers on several layers of paper towels uh, in a paper plate and the roots from the sunflower seeds did penetrate uh, through the paper towel and formed a very nice strong mat which is one of the interesting things about microgreens is that you do get these strong mats. I also want to point out on this uh, you can see this is not your plastic 10 by 20 tray this is a stainless steel tray that restaurants use a kind of a standard size it's just a little bit bigger than a 1020 but the point about this is of course if you grow fill this full of microgreens you can take that tray to the restaurant and they can lift the, the flat lift the microgreens out and put them in one of their own trays. These trays will last forever. Uh, they clean up very well so it's very sanitary which is a good consideration. They did cost $11 each at a restaurant supply place compared to what two and a quarter or so for the plastic trays but um, you know these things will outlive me so I think this is a, a good investment in terms of growing microgreens. Since I'm showing all my goodies I may as well show you this one as well which is something I'm calling microponics. Basically what this is is a piece of shade cloth, plastic shade cloth suspended over a tray of water using these binder clips and on top of it a crop of pea sprouts growing. This is maybe a week or ten days old you see nice growth and if you were to peel this away you can see that there are roots growing under there the whole thing is a mass of roots and every now and then I just come in and put some water on it and keep it going. This may be an approach that, that I'll use for other things. I've been looking at ways to suspend a bunch of seeds over a pan of water which was the original idea with the stainless pans. 
and maybe you could use uh, cooling racks like chefs use. You might be able to cut down wire shelves to fit inside these things. There might be some honeycomb material you could find and then lay cloth on top of it and have something there again that can grow. And a question with this is when you're done with this, and this is true of also of the all of the microgreens, is will I be able to separate the rope from the mass of roots underneath? And we'll just have to see how that's going to work out. I'll finish up by showing you my current microgreens setup. This is an example of making use of things you had laying around or standing around. In this case, on the top you see a shop light, which used to be located over a bench to my right. The shelf has been there for quite a few years storing things, and I've gradually taken over more and more pieces of it uh, to do my microgreens as I've altered my method and learned how to do it. Lights uh, are basically pig lights and clamp lights and things that I've collected over the years doing photography and video, and uh, this seemed like a better use for them. Originally I had them hanging down from the top of the shelves, but I found that that was a maintenance problem in terms of getting at the, the plants to water them and inspect them and so on. So the last run of modification was to take all these lights and suspend them around the edges of the shelves. Uh, ultimately, when I build the next unit, of course, I'll use something like four foot LED strips. But for right now, this is doing okay. Um, these are all basically the 60 watt replacement uh, 5000K LED bulbs. Things seem to grow just right. Uh, what else you see here is the reflecting material, which is an old space blanket that I had laying around. When I would stand in front of this, I would see a lot of light spilling out of it. So that's where I thought, well, let's um, you know take the space blanket and, and cover it to keep the light inside. And that's a good idea. Now, under certain circumstances, that could be a ventilation problem. In a larger installation, you might just hang space blankets along the sides and leave the ends open so that air could circulate through the system. But I would say this is definitely a good idea. I see a lot of microgreen installations on YouTube videos where I would say, frankly, people are wasting a lot of the light that could be used to grow plants. And I think it's definitely a good idea to put a reflecting material in the system to, to keep a lot of those photons that you're now wasting. Further adventures in this, trying to work up to uh, having a commercial production here. Uh, you can see from various things that I've shown you that even at this level I'm producing quite a bit of stuff. It's actually, I have to make an effort to actually consume what I'm growing now. Uh, and I think that's a, a really good sign that microgreens are definitely something that you should do uh, and can do with essentially very little equipment and very little space.